What's up, everybody? It is, let's see, Wednesday, the 28th of February, 2018, and this is the Promotional Malpractice live chat. My name is Luke Thomas. Thank you so much for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. Now, as you can tell, the setup here is a little bit different today. Um, I am on a different machine. I bought a machine dedicated to live streaming, but I haven't run a hard wire to it yet, so it's still on Wi-Fi. So I'm a little bit nervous about the connection. Plus, you're noticing that the uh, backdrop is not here. You remember the two doors? You haven't seen the two doors in like a couple of years, really. Uh, they're back, but just for today, I've got a lot of things going on here in my little makeshift studio, and I just couldn't get it going in time with everything else. So um, it'll be back next week. Apologies for the doors. The lighting's all messed up in here, too, because I got so many things coming and going with the home renovations. But I want to try out this machine, and I want to try out, uh, see how it went. So... Hopefully it goes okay. Appreciate you guys watching. As always, I appreciate your patience. Do me a favor, give the video a like, and of course, subscribe to MMA Fighting below. On today's program, you know what we're going to talk about. John Jones before the California State Athletic Commission doing his thing. Let's see, what else? Uh, UFC 222 is this weekend. People are sleeping on it. Bill Tour 195 is this weekend as well. Um, there's a lot going on. Best place to get your questions in, of course, is going to be at MMA Fighting where this window is embedded. Um... Comments that turn green get priority, but not exclusivity. I'm trying to think of what else. Um, that's about it. That's about it. Uh, okay. So with that out of the way, let's get to some of these questions, shall we? Uh, all right. And by the way, I've got my, I don't know if y'all can see, I've got dual monitors working now. I'm trying to see if that's better. I've got Twitter on this monitor, and I've got the live chat questions on this monitor. I've also got my... Let's see if y'all can see it. It's a little hard. Well, you can't really see it. I'll wait till I drink down. I got my Roy Lichtenstein glass from the uh, National Gallery of Art because I like art and shit. <laughs> All right. Hopefully this machine works. Again, this machine really is designed for a hardwire. And when I move downstairs, I'll have a hardwire to it. But there's other renovations going on and I couldn't get the hardwire run in time. But I still think it's a better machine than my laptop, so we'll see. All right, here we go. Reactions, takeaways from the Jones CSAC hearing. How did you see it? Anything stood out after? After witnessing the CSAC hearing, do you have a different view on how USADA is going to deal with Jones? Man, what do you want to say about yesterday? Let me move in here just a little bit, if I may, so I can lean back a little as well. Um, that was crazy. That was really, really kind of crazy. So I have three major takeaways that I'd like to get to if I can. Number one, first major takeaway is I did not think that was a very harsh punishment, to be honest. Um, now, whether you think that's good or that's bad is a different story, but I didn't think they really hammered him. Now, I had Brett Okamoto on my show yesterday. I spoke to him and he seemed to think it was pretty harsh, right? They took the max that they could legally take from him in terms of the 40%. Like, they didn't go 20 or 30. They went to the full limit. Okay, fair enough. Um, they didn't merely just suspend him, giving him the option to return whenever the suspension was directly over. They, um, they took his license away. But they only took his license away for a year dating back to the original time of infraction, which means in August of 2018, he can apply for reinstatement. That doesn't necessarily mean they will reinstate him. But... You have the executive director, Andy Foster, stating explicitly that he believed John Jones, right? So you've got the guy who is basically sort of like the head of it to an extent. I mean, it's not exactly the way I would look at it, but um, sort of a leading figure in that commission advocating on behalf of John's case in that sense, right, in terms of the plausibility of it all. Um, and you could see that they didn't want to really, like nobody really wants to pull the no one really wants to do the nuclear option in anybody's career. You know, I don't think that they, um, you know, they might consider that if they do that, then would the UFC really come back to California more than they are already scheduled to do? Uh, and by the way, I realize it's really white in here, so I'm trying to fix that a little bit. Maybe that's a little better. Not really. Whatever. Hang on. It's a little better, I guess. Um, 
So they didn't really want to do the nuclear option. So in the end of the day, what did they take from him? They took him from $205,000, which is probably a tiny fraction of how much he ultimately made on pay-per-view and, and the, with his purse and whatever sponsorship money he has out there. Then on top of that, they just took away his license for about a year. I suspect that he'll be able to like do some dumbass community service stuff that you know he was bringing up over and over again. But I don't know how valuable it'll be in the end. But I, I, probably valuable enough to get his license back. Now, of course, they're all... None of this counts unless and until USADA signs off on it. And that's the big X factor. So that's my first takeaway. My second takeaway is I hope everyone out there finally takes a moment to realize just how strong the case was for Yoel Romero and Tim Means and the other athletes out there who have been able to credibly prove that they took a contaminated supplement. If you look at and talk to Howard Jacobs, uh, he has talked about this on his website and other, other interviews, of the... I mean, how many clients has this guy had over the years? Hundreds? He says 75% of them are provable contaminated supplement issues. I, I, I absolutely believe that. And you can say whatever other suspicions you have about Yoel Romero, but let's talk about his case. Let's talk about Tim Means' case. What can you really say about it? You can say a lot of things, including, but not limited to, they had actual evidence that not merely the object that they had purchased was contaminated, but then USADA goes and instantly verifies with their own purchases of that product, not just really one, several of these, and then test them all to prove that the entire line is contaminated. And unless you're willing to believe, which I suppose is possible given the sophistication of the Russian doping program, but of course that was state-sponsored, that a, a UFC fighter can go and convince a supplement manufacturer to contaminate their entire line, opening up to all kinds of legal liability, to satisfy merely one customer to avoid a USADA sanction, it stands to reason that there's probably a ton of contamination out there. And USADA basically cleared both of them. Now, they did give them a very mild punishment relative to their problems with strict liability. But what they didn't do was come out and say that no, no, these guys doped. They're like, no, they just need to be a little bit more um, diligent about monitoring these kinds of things. Very, very different. And why does that stand out to you? Because John had no physical evidence yesterday. None. Zero. Zilch. That was kind of shocking to me. That was truly shocking to me. Let me pull this over. I'd rather have this on this side of the screen. Sorry, y'all. It's a little distracting. Here we are. There we are. Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. He had no physical evidence whatsoever. None. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because they said they went and tried to test all the different things that they had, right? Let's test this supplement. Let's test this cream. And none of it came up. So they had no physical evidence. Tim Means, Yoel Romero, and many other athletes, they had real evidence. Again, not really what they took. The whole line of stuff was uh, contaminated. I hope in retrospect, we can at least appreciate that. Those guys had strong arguments. Those guys were able to demonstrate that, no, this is not what you think. This is this is clearly very good evidence, which is why the, the uh, United States Anti-Doping Agency was ultimately like, okay, fair enough. Mild punishment for a violation of strict liability, which is basically the minimum they can hand out, and be on your way. I, I, I really hope that people take a second look at that from now on, because it is an absolutely different scenario than what John was in yesterday. He would roll up in there being like, I really have no physical evidence, so let me give you a polygraph, which we know is largely inadmissible in courts of law, as well as arbitration hearings related to the Court of Arbitration of Sport, the CAS. Doesn't really have any value there, even dating all the way back to Alberto Contador and before. So that's not really helpful. And then they had this guy, this anti-doping expert. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who appeared to be, you know, Dr. Rick Niviera, uh, was it Nick Riviera from The Simpsons? The wrist bones connected to the wrist watch. I mean, that's really what we had with that guy yesterday, saying that he had information provided to him from a bodybuilding website, that he didn't really know the exact amount because he didn't know John's weight. He had spent about four hours researching and about $400 a clip, which, by the way, people thought was a lot. It's not a lot. It's very little or moderate anyway, I would say, in terms of what those guys can typically charge in cases like this. And all he could do was, because they had no physical evidence, they just tried to create a narrative of use where if you had this bracketed, no uh, test positive in the middle, well, on one side of it anyway, one positive test that we can create a narrative about the intentionality of use. But you had the previous state's witness 
saying, well, look, I mean, it's possible that it was unintentional, but it's possible that it wasn't. And the reason why we don't know is because terinobol is not a controlled substance. There's not been hardly any tests done on it. Very little is actually known relative to other drugs. And so we can't really affirmatively, de affirmatively declare, based on what we have here, really anything of note. In fact, you had another doctor on the California State Athletic Commission noting that he has prescribed medicine to his patients and that they have taken it once or twice or every other day or something and then, and then left it alone. And could that produce the same kind of testing result, right? And the answer was basically, yes, it could, depending on how you dosed it, when you took it, how long you took it. In other words, there was really no the argument, the narrative around bracketed no use, use, uh, or you know, po no positive test, positive test was very weak. But if you have no physical evidence, what else can you do? You have to create something. Of course, then he brought up his character, and I thought the everyone like this is my point about this, and I know everyone's going to disagree, and that's okay. The truth is not very popular, right? You're not going to get really popular speaking a lot of truth, especially about people who have compromised, um, perceived compromised integrity issues. Um, it is not that I think that you can't talk about his character because he introduced it. And how many times did he talk about going and speaking to schools and everything else, right? And all of the compliance he had with the community service, either with his issues related to um, crimes of against the law, right? The hit and run, things like that, uh, as well as whatever was mandated by USADA, that he had been on this sojourn of self-discovery as well as um, giving back to the community. And that this should count for something. Now you can weigh whatever you want about that. So I, I agree that some level of examining his character was, uh, frankly, not merely warranted but inevitable, because of there was nothing else on which you could make this case. Like you go back to the Nick Diaz case, there were some issues about his repeated offense, but Lucas Middlebrook had enough evidence to make an argument about this, the nature of the argument itself. What can we say about these tests involved? What can we say about marijuana research? What can we say about what's known about the drug, excretion times, detection windows, all those sorts of things. But that's because there's been, I mean, relative to Terenobol, an order of mag several orders of magnitude more research done. There's actually a lot known relative to Terenobol about marijuana. And they're able to end detection windows and how it shows up in the blood and how the metabolites show up and for what reasons and in certain body types and certain uh, you know dose concentrations and and what that means for euphoric windows. I mean, all, they have so much more information. People were bagging on Howard Jacobs. Yo, Howard Jacobs has been a very successful attorney for people who had various anti-doping infractions, um, and some of them have been you know he had Floyd Landis as a uh, clients, but he also had was it Diana Torisi the um, women's basketball player, he had her completely exonerated so she could play in the 2004 Olympics, right? So it's not really true that um, he's a bad attorney. But if you have no physical evidence upon which to go, at least Lucas Middlebrook was dealing with a client who was dealing with a substance where, A, the law enforcement around it is incredibly suspect, which I've been over a thousand times on this podcast. But on top of that, there's a ton of research. There's no research about Terenobol. So it's like of all the things he could have, and however it got in his system, and you can make up your own mind about that, Terenobol was like one of the worst ones they could have had because there's just nothing they can really say affirmatively um, with any real, you know, reasonable degree of scientific certainty about it because not much is really known. Um, so I really hope that that gives folks some pause about going back to Yoel Romero and Tim Means. The last conclusion I think I would draw, uh, and there's many you could draw, you have to wonder about what's going to happen with USADA. You have to wonder. Now, I'm of two minds. After it was over yesterday, I was like, oh, he's cooked. He's cooked. Because you had the fact that you have no physical evidence and what this narrative is around use, if you want to call that physical evidence, is, I mean, to call it, to call it minimal would be an exaggeration. Uh, certainly not enough to draw any f firm conclusion. So you have no physical evidence. This is a second offense. Now it's a slightly different second offense because it's not the same substance. And they did actually have physical. They had they, the, the funny part about the first John Jones incident was they actually had physical evidence in that case. They were able to show that these medication. Now there's some issues about how it got to them and and the stories about how it got to them and, and the consistency of them. 
But in terms of the physical evidence, they actually had some in his favor in the first time out, which is why he only got a uh, a moderate punishment the first time. Now they gave him the full year, but they could have, you know, um, they, they acknowledged that while he was negligent, they they found that the plausibility of his argument was was reasonable. Now you may not, but they did. So take that for what it's worth. They don't have any of that this time. So you have no physical evidence, at least some kind of a second offense. And then on top of it, <coughs> this I just couldn't believe. I guess I can actually. In 2015, when the USADA program was introduced, I think all UFC fighters had to go some uh, degree of compliant um, training about the USADA program. And I don't think there's like rigorous courses or anything like that, but they had to sort of go through the motions of watching it. Yes, do you understand? Click. Yes, I understand. And that he didn't do any of that. And uh, and that he admitted his manager had. Now, people are going to throw Malky under the bus uh, for that. And John threw his manager under the bus for that to an extent, really. Um, I'll just say this. While that was an insane admission, and I don't think that would need it to be done, I'm betting that that's not the only manager that does that for their client in MMA. I'm going to bet that that's pretty widespread, to be honest. Now, that has nothing to do with John's case, given everything else that he's up against. But I just want to point out, if you guys think that it's just John Jones and Malky Kawa doing that, I would ask you to... to Seriously reconsider that. I bet that is a widespread practice, a widespread practice. These guys farm out to their managers, particularly the bigger ones, all of the paperwork stuff. Hey, yeah, 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 just do it for me. They just don't run into issues where it becomes up later. You know, Demetrius Johnson is managed by Malky, and maybe he watched those things. Um, but if he didn't, I wouldn't be surprised. If those guys, if their managers fill out their whereabouts paperwork, I would not be surprised. Um, just to be clear about that, that doesn't excuse it. But I don't think this is an isolated practice to these two guys at all. At all, I don't believe that. So when it was over yesterday, I'm like, wow, you, you, you admitted you had your essentially this for, I mean, it's a click of a button, I think, but some sort of forgery in a sense. Second offense, and you got no physical evidence. Oh my God, this is looking terrible. But then the more I thought about it, man, I'm not ready to call you Sada's bluff on this. You know, I'm like you, I'm thinking to myself, God, this looks bad, you know, it's just in terms of what he can get away with. But on the other hand, I'm going to move on to another question here. On the other hand, every time I thought it went bad for somebody, it really never did. Nobody important anyway. You know, I thought Vitor Belfort up there crying before the Nevada Athletic Commission. I was like, oh, he's sunk. Nope. It's a punishment of note, but it didn't really affect him in the long run. Chael Sonnen, every time I thought he was sunk, they gave him a punishment, but in the long run, not a big deal. Uh, Anderson Silva, we'll see what happens with USADA this time. But that time he went there, when we was talking about the Thai sex drugs and everything. Did it really affect him long term? Now, the second one might, but did that one? Nope. And I realized that was a little bit different. That was just before USADA got into the program. And, and, the, and the TRT issue with Vitor and, and Che was a little bit different. So here's my point. This is my last takeaway about this. This is going to be a big test for USADA. Because it's one thing to destroy the career, which I absolutely agree that they did. Of Francisco Rivera. Because who is Francisco Rivera? Well, I think he's a good fighter, but he's not a very popular attraction. No one really knows who he is other than hardcore fans. Right. And he brought some of that on himself, test positive for clenbuterol, and then and then nefariously tried to um, doctor documents to show um, a certain amount of whereabouts compliance that was not the case. But uh, and so they sort of threw the book at him. Do I think they're going to throw the book at John, even though I think they could? I don't. There's a part of me that absolutely does not think that at all. In fact, I'm betting that the most he'll get is two years. He might even get less. He might even get less. Because if you're – there's some lingering feeling that I have that even if they – do they do they have cause to throw the book at him? Yes. Do they have a willingness? We're going to see. We're going to see. Two years, I'll believe. And that wouldn't be the end of his career, by the way, because in, in July, that would be a one year already. Uh, he would still have time left. It would be a disaster, but it wouldn't be the end of his career. And I got to be honest, man, there's a part of me that thinks that they're not willing to pull the trigger on somebody that important. Somebody that important to the promotion, the promotion that has voluntarily hired them, that doesn't need to necessarily keep them around. You know, they, they all want to create this where we have no conflicts of interest. There are always conflicts of interest. 
there are always conflicts of interest. If you ruin the product enough where they can't ship it out anymore, they'll just get rid of you. And I think they know that. Now, whether or not they 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 think that their job is important enough to, to adhere to sticking it to John, I guess we'll see. But I, I absolutely, part of me, two years, I'll believe. Four years, I do not believe at all. And, I'm, and I think there's actually a decent chance it's less, 18 months or something. I don't think he'll compete in 2018. I'll buy that. But do I think he might compete in 2019? Big part of me thinks yes. Whether you think it's a good thing or not, separate issue. All right. Uh, let's see. If you had your way, would you not have Rousey WWE articles on MMA fighting? dot com anymore like you've said she moved on to another world she has nothing to do with mma anymore let's not forget she treated mma media like garbage on her way out same with john jones athletes treating you like garbage now the, if you want to make an argument about the relevancy of the topic that's a one argument but athletes being mean to you is not a reason to not cover them and if that's the way you think this is not the career for you because you'll do a real bad job um Let's not forget she treated MMA media like garbage on her way out. Personally, as a fan and frequent visitor of MMA fighting, uh, I would rather not see any articles regarding Rousey's WWE performance stunts. It has nothing to do with MMA, and I hold MMA fighting to a standard of excellence. When reading articles on MMA, I don't want WWE articles at MMAfighting.com. We get it. She is a former MMA fighter. Let her do her WWE thing. She has nothing to do with MMA in the world anymore. I get the whole traffic thing. That's how you guys make money, but I don't want to see WWE articles every time Rousey makes a WWE performance. A couple of things I would say. Look, personally, I think the staff would have a wide range of editorial views about this, to be honest. Um, and even back on Bloody Elbow, I was butting heads with Nate Wilcox back then about, you know, do we want to have this kind of thing on the side or do we not? And what's the line? You know, look, the editors we have, um, they're great. They're super talented. They've been doing this longer than I have. And um, they believe it's up the, uh, that it's worth at this juncture covering. I think over time that probably will dissipate a little bit as it becomes clear that she's created further and further distance. If you don't like it, don't click on it. I have read your complaint now on the air. The editors watched this. They have now heard it. Um, personally, if I was in control, I'd have a little bit less. But, uh, but I think some coverage is probably okay. Um, like I said, I'd, personally, I'd probably dial it back a little bit. But... I think the editors here generally do a great job. Let the, let your voice be heard. Speak up. Again, I'm reading your comment out loud. They, they're going to hear this. And uh, if you don't like them, definitely don't click on them. Let's see. Someone says, I don't want to see WWE articles full stop. MMA Fighting is a sports-based website, not an entertainment site. If I want to know about that S, I'll check out TMZ. No pro wrestling articles. <clears throat> Ronda or no Ronda. I, I Look. You know, I understand that completely. That'd be sort of more in keeping with my preferences. But again, make your voice heard. Let MMA fighting be known. Vote with your attention dollars. If you don't like it, definitely don't click on it. And I think over time, this will just, it, it will, it's like Brock Lesnar. When he first went back, there was some coverage about it and how much would the MMA be involved in it. And then over time, it just sort of goes away. I, I think it'll be like that. So, so there you go. Uh, okay. I enjoy watching John fight, but seriously, how could you sought and not hammer him after this? I can think of a few ways. John does not have any type of real defense. All of his supplements were tested. None of them came back as tainted, at least not for Terenabol anyway. Terenabol is an illegal anabolic steroid. If you saw it, does not punish people for testing positive for that, as opposed to say legal substances, I can get a GNC, right? Like what Lyoto Machida tested positive for, which you can get at Walgreens or Dwayne Reed, um, seven keto DHEA. What's the point? Someone also notes, it's his second offense, and he already had the I'm an idiot negligent defense before. Number four, John admitted to not doing the online USADA classes and having his management sign off for him. Not a big deal on its own, which I agree with, but given everything else, there has to be something they consider. I also agree with that. Now, someone says, I understand Luke's position on anti-doping, but that's not really relevant here. But seriously, based on the system and rules as they currently are, fair point. What good justification could you sought to have for giving anything less than the maximum punishment? Because you have to wonder if they go severe, will the UFC cut ties with them? Not, not immediately, not over this incident, but they know the UFC is struggling. Don't think that they don't. 
uh, that this is a year where they could really, they won't get him back in 2018, but 2019, they can get Brock in 2018 and they can find a couple other, you know, you could see him punk comes back and, you know, we'll see what they can do with Conor McGregor and Habib and all them. There's a couple of aces up their sleeve. If they can get John Jones back in 2019, you know, they want to, you know, they want to. So to me, this is a huge test for how rigorous the anti-doping system is for USADA. If you're going to, I mean, they did a four year, like they ended, they ended Francisco Rivera's career, four year ban, right? You're going to give that guy a four year ban. And I understand that he manipulated paperwork and that's pretty bad. Is that worse in your judgment than the two time offenses and given the totality of the evidence there? Now, that's, that's going to vary on your perspective. I'm just wondering, it's real easy to be like, boom, we're going to bang the gavel and wag the finger at Francisco Rivera. Let me see you do it to John Jones. Not saying they won't. Big part of me thinks that they won't, but a big part of me is I'm conflicted. I'm like right down the middle. Part of me felt like yesterday was an epic disaster, and in many ways it was. And a part of me feels like they know which side their bread is buttered on. There's no real way to have an anti-doping system free of conflict. There's always conflict, uh, conflict of interest anyway. So we're going to see, man, whether you are like me and you think the current anti-doping system is dramatically flawed or whether you, even if you think it's flawed, you think it's absolutely essential, the most essential thing in the world, this is going to be a huge test for them. Huge test. Someone says, what good justification could USADA have for giving anything less than the maximum punishment? The ability to keep going with them? Am I the only one who finds Jones even less credible after the CSAC hearing? I doubt that. I don't... Look, the fact that he didn't have physical evidence is not a determinant of use, right? It's not a you. You could have you could be completely innocent and have no evidence. You could be completely guilty and have a ton of evidence that you could at least manipulate in some kind of way to make yourself look innocent. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a proof of guilt or innocence. But what what is true in real world has nothing to do with what you can prove. What you can prove is the issue, and what he could prove yesterday was very little, very little. But they gave him a, I thought they gave him a fairly light punishment in California. So I guess we'll see. Luke, you should check out Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> Stephen A. Smith. He has a lot of smart things to say. You should check him out, Luke. Luke, have you heard of him? Have you heard of Stephen A. Smith? <laughs> what was that old man doing? Yo, who? Okay, the old man you can just kind of laugh off. But honestly, who came off as less credible than him yesterday? <sighs> I'm not trying to make fun of the elderly, but when you're out there admitting that you don't have, that you forgot your hearing aid and you just missed half the questions, and this guy's deciding your, can you imagine? Imagine, just imagine for a second you were actually innocent, right? Just, just, just not, forget John Jones, but imagine you're in the same situation, like you did everything by the book, and somehow this insane, weird, esoteric steroid ends up in your system. You're like, what am I gonna do? And you test everything. And you're like, oh god, I, I can't find it, right? And you test all the bottles and 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 you just did everything. You took a lot of time. You did everything possible. And you you know that you're hanging on by a thread because you can't prove it. Just imagine that's you for a second. And you show up <laughs> and one of the commissioners is like, have you heard of Skip Bayless? You know, it's like, I got to, my future hangs in the balance of father time. You know, the dude's life expectancy is like Sunday. He is sitting there showing up talking about, I forgot my hearing aids. Oh my God. What? What? To me, that was the like, that that was the most embarrassing moment of the whole day. Yo, man, you got a responsibility to these people. <laughs> and everyone's like, well, that's John. We all knew he's guilty. Yeah, you know that. This guy thinks Stephen A. Smith is like some under, he's like some underground figure, like typing up you know, zines. From the 1990s on a typewriter and then leaving them, you know, at, at, at indie used bookstores or something. Have you heard of Stephen A. Smith? Like this is the weather underground. I, I was, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing out there. And we laugh it off because in the end he was harmless, I suppose. What if he wasn't? What if he was vengeful? What if he was a prick like me? <laughs> Who, when they feel slighted, they want to lash out at the world. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I was, if I was John Jones, I'd be like, look, all's well that ends well, I guess. But if that was you and your sports future 
hung in the balance of Old Man River over there, you might have cause to be pissed. You might. I couldn't believe that, man. I couldn't believe that. Oh, my God. That was that was crazy. That was crazy. Have you heard of Stephen A. Smith? No, nah, man. You are ahead of the time. Have you have you heard of the combustion engine? It'll get you faster to the Hilton Doubletree than horseback, I hear. You might want to look into that. Seriously, man, that's why, you, I mean, everyone, like, you don't want to, like, and I realize I'm being a little mean, but come on, man. Come on. You got, you know, you got to test the elderly for their eyesight and their hair. That dude, does that dude have a driver's license? Seriously? Better get that guy an Uber. Or a Lyft. So it says Marvin versus Izzy. Oh, by the way, I have a bit of an update for you. How could I forget? Do you know how you guys asked me mm, two, three weeks ago or so, uh, maybe more, was Joanna and Jacek using anybody um, for her weight cut? At the time, I said no. She was going to be tra being trained. I know she's being physically trained by Phil Daru over in uh, American Top Team, and he puts up clips all the time on social media if you guys want to go take a look at those. Um, I found out a little bit of a nugget. She has brought in George Lockhart for this camp. Uh, I don't know when he shows up. I don't know exactly when that cut will start, but I was told that George Lockhart is going to be a part of the weight cutting um, for UFC 223 for her. So George Lockhart, pretty, you know, the cyborg stuff notwithstanding, and there's a lot of fault to go around there, but every one of his other clients, they've had pretty easy weight cuts. So um, if you are a Yuan and Jacek fan, that's probably pretty good news. Uh, hi, Luke. There was a lot to talk about. Uh, what should be next for Israel Adesanya? And now we know he is fighting Marvin Vittori in Glendale. I, I love that fight. What do you think of his next step and his opponent is the right choice? So this is an interesting one because whatever Marvin Vittori lacks in the, in the technical precision and creativity that Adesanya has, Adesanya lacks the physicality and the bruising nature of the in, the uh, in-close fighting of Vittori. And so you saw against his last fight against Wilkinson, he was able to stave off the attacks, not always able to create separation, but over time um, he got the stoppage and could have been stopped even earlier. But Vittori is a much better, much better version of that. Better athlete, bigger, stronger. He is very hittable, which against Adesanya is not a great matchup, but at the same time, you wonder what kind of test this would be. So I favor Adesanya. But Vittori is a big, strong middleweight. And I, I, that was not the fight that occurred to me at first. But then I, the more I thought about it, I was like, that is an interesting test. You have to favor Adesanya, but you also have to wonder exactly what it's going to go. If he doesn't mind his P's and Q's, that's a fight Vittori could steal. He could take a beating doing it, but he could steal it. He could win it out wrestling in the clinch, things like that. So um, love that fight. Love that fight. Uh, have you seen the Glendale Fox card? It is stacked. What do you think of the card? So let's look at it, shall we? UFC Glendale. Let's take a look. I got to get a better uh, keyboard for a PC. Okay, here is the fight card as it stands. This will be April 14th at the Gila River Arena, not Gila, in Glendale, Arizona. People think it's a Gila monster. It is a Gila monster. Uh, Dustin Poirier taking on Justin Gaethje. Fire. Carlos Condit versus Matt Brown, fire. Marvin Vittori versus Israel Adesanya, fire. Michelle Waterson versus Courtney Casey, if not fire, pretty good. Tim Boach versus Shoeface, fire. Wilson Hayes versus John Moraga, fire. Christoph Joku versus Brad Tavares, perfectly great fight. Shayna Dobson versus Lauren Mueller, Mueller, I don't know. Uh, Diego Lima taking on Yushin Okami, it's decent. And then Arjun Buller returns against Adam Wiesoric. That card is tremendo. Tremendo. And I guess they also have in that card Luke Sanders versus Patrick Williams, Matthew Lopez versus Alejandro Perez, Abdul Razak al Hassan versus Muslim Salikov, and then Gilbert Burns versus Lando Venati. Yo, that card is the truth. That card absolutely is the truth. Uh... 
What is this? Brock Lesnar is maybe back. How will the UFC utilize it? Dana White hinted heavily that he thinks Brock will be back. Who do you think they will put him up against and on what card? Up against, I don't know. That part's really hard to understand. Did they do another Kane rematch? They might, you know. Um, that one I don't have a strong sense of. They could do another one where versus Francis and Ganu, uh, maybe Verdum or something. I don't really know how they're feeling about that one. But number one, I, I would love to see him back. Uh, I know there's a lot of detective in the hardcore audience, not a lot of enthusiasm for that, but you can count me in. Number one. Number two, um, who would I prefer? That's a bit of a different issue. Who would I prefer? Let me pull up heavyweight as it stands. Let's see. All right, so here's heavyweight. Kai Tuivasa, no. Junior Albini, no. Tim Johnson, Arlovsky, depending on how things go for him this weekend. Olenek, Struve, Tybora, Volkov, Derek Lewis. That'd be a fun one. Derek Lewis versus Brock Lesnar. Because he already beat Mark Hunt. And then you have Curtis Blades of Kane Velasquez and Bruce Verdum. So Lewis and then Velasquez in the top of the division would be cool. Or if they get John Jones back, which is obviously a big if, that would be an amazing fight. Or... Um, Daniel Cormier, they can make that one happen. That would be kind of fun, too. So, so sure. Someone says Brock would not fight Kane or Alistair again. Probably not. The Ganu fight is a huge fight, even without a title. Yeah, that's true. Uh, all right, MVP versus David Rickles. How do you like this matchup for Paige? By the way, this will be at Bellator 200. The caveman might test Paige's wrestling, but he hasn't. But he's been knocked out of 155. Mark Hunt rematch. First of all, Mark Hunt wouldn't take the rematch. Someone's like, come on, Luke. Hunt, Mark Hunt rematch. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? You think for two seconds he's going to take that rematch? All he does is talk about how he doesn't want to give opportunities to steroid users and how they're all cheaters and everything else. He's going to go back and do that again and probably lose again? What's wrong with you? Uh, now, back to MVP versus Dave Rickles. Let's see. How do you like this matchup for Paige? I do like it. The caveman might test Paige's wrestling, but he's been knocked out at 155. Should Beltor have pushed for the daily fight or matched him up with Larkin or Koreshkov or even Benson Henderson or Michael Chandler? Personally, I'm bored with his gimmick and would like to see him in a legit challenge. Well, I think you're sleeping on uh, Rickles a little bit. I am not suggesting to you that Rickles is on par with a Chandler. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think that's a really fair argument to make. What I would say is, relative to many of the guys he's been facing... I would put Rickles as a slightly more interesting challenge with some additional liabilities. For example, he doesn't have the same. Let me pull up um, MVPs. Uh, Michael Page. Let me pull up his uh, Wikipedia page here for just a second. Here is his last, let's say, three fights, right? Um, Jeremy Holloway, Evangelista Santos, and then Fernando Gonzalez. And he barely, barely beat Fernando Gonzalez in a terrible fight. Fernando Gonzalez is harder to hurt and harder to put away. But I don't think Kerry is necessarily the same offensive firepower as Dave Rickles. Dave Rickles or Dave Rickles has sort of a tenacity about wrestling that you can get after that a little bit. I wouldn't call him necessarily the best wrestler at 155 in the Bill Torletwood division, but... There's a certain amount of urgency to his game, even if that creates more openings. So it's an interesting fight. It's sort of like uh, Adesanya versus Vittori in a sense, where Page, if he wants to use the, you know, the real accuracy and, and and higher level striking that he has and can, he can do a lot. However, there are some tests about the physicality and about the wrestling that could come into play here. It's a little bit. I don't want to overstate the, the similarity, but it's a little bit similar to that. But you know, pushing him against Daly, I, I don't think it's a good matchup for him. Larkin or Koreshkov, I mean, nope. Um, and then Benson Henderson and, and and Michael Chandler. I mean, it's a welterweight fight, obviously, so those guys would have to come up. Um, but I think this is actually a pretty fine test. It's not like he's made a ton of advancement, right? I mean, he struggled against Fernando Gonzalez. I, I don't know why people think – you might think he'll beat Dave Rickles. Okay, I'll, I'm, I'm not here to argue the case for Dave Rickles winning. But as a fine challenge through incremental progress, sure. Sure, I'll make that argument. Sean Shelby. Hi, Luke. Hope you are well. What are your thoughts on UFC matchmaker Sean Shelby and his performance since taking over from Joe Silva just a year ago? Do you think he is doing a good job building contenders and making entertaining fights with the tools he has available? 
Have you had any dealings with him? How do you find him? Have you had any feedback from fighters about him? Well, fighters, if I'm being honest, don't have a lot of positive feedback about matchmakers for the most part, especially not Joe Silva. A lot of them hated him. You might recall uh, Rampage Jackson saying Joe Silva couldn't match a pair of shoes. Um, and I know plenty of fighters who don't like Sean Shelby. Um, the matchmakers can be, how do you want to say it? They can be forceful. They can be bullies. They can be bullies. Um, I have had dealings with Sean Shelby. I've had a number of um, conversations with him over time, and I found him to be very intelligent, um, very hardworking. I like him a lot, if I can just be honest with you. Now, I don't have to work with him in the capacity that fighters do. Many of them might have a different relationship with him. And some, by the way, to be clear, some fighters like him very much. So that all of them do. But, you know, you definitely, it gets a little dicier over time. Um, so, with that being said, I find him to be incredibly hardworking, as I mentioned, incredibly bright. But he has such a different job than Joe Silva did. They had much more arm-twisting ability than um, Sean Shelby does. It's just a new UFC. Guys are exercising their leverage in ways, whatever that leverage is, in ways they never did before. They're saying no in ways they didn't before. You have rankings now where two doesn't want to fight three and three doesn't want to fight four now. It's a totally different scenario. It's very hard to compare their jobs. Shelby was very much a, a in lockstep in terms of vision as Joe Silva has barred a lot of his tactics. Um, and Mick Maynard, I can't say a lot about. I don't I don't know the gentleman very well. Um, so that's a different story. But if you're asking me, like, do I think Sean Shelby's doing a good job with this new reality that's out there and the tools available to him? Yeah, I would say that he is. I would say that he is. I, I've, I, I don't know who could do a better job than him right now. Uh, maybe there's somebody out there. I'm not saying that there isn't, but um, which isn't to say this things he said I haven't agree. Uh, you know, in the course of our conversations, he said some things I didn't agree with. Sure, but um, generally speaking, I find him to be highly intelligent and um, the right guy for the job. Generally speaking, is Stevens spelled Stephen apostrophe s? So apparently, it's possessive of a gentleman named Stephen. Not Jeremy Stevens, a repeat offender. <laughs> Lost in all the hubbub about whether or not the Stevens knee, I don't know who the Stephen gentleman is, Stephen Wright, Stephen Morocco, MMA junkie, landed is that this is not the first time he has tried a kick to a down opponent. Downed. Have to conjugate that. Uh, after knocking down Frankie Edgar with a huge head kick, he followed up with a knee linked to the video art. Let's see that video. Let's see. Are they going to show it here or what? Oh, here we go. Oh. Oh. Kick. Yeah, but Frankie, oh, well, uh, maybe. And you know who didn't do anything about it? Keith Peterson, another good referee. I mean that sincerely. Keith Peterson's an excellent referee. He didn't stop it. Everyone was getting on Big Dan's case, and I'm just not really understanding why. I'm not saying that the non-call was good. It's not what I'm saying. Probably should have jumped in. You can probably make an argument that he should have jumped in. My issue is that that job is so difficult to not give them the opportunity to have instant replay to correct it, which officials in, in baseball they have it in certain circumstances. In football, they have it in American football. They have it in a ton of different circumstances. Like, can you imagine American football without the use of instant replay? It's it's virtually impossible. It, it, it is part and parcel of the game. Did they cross the first down marker? Did he step outside? Did he get two feet in on the catch? If it's the NFL. It's one foot. It's college, right? Um, did he make a football move? Did he have control of the ball? How could you possibly do that job without it? I would ask the same thing of referees. How can we possibly expect them to do that job? So you can say, well, not great that he didn't stop it there, but the real fault was that we don't put him in a position to correct the mistake. That's the that to me is the key to take away. Everyone was like, why didn't Dan stop it? Well, because he, you know, he didn't make a great call. But lots of good officials make not great calls. The really good ones make a lot of good calls and then correct the bad ones. But he can't. Insane. Totally insane. Alternate lightweight universe. Following his second loss to Bendo, Frankie Edgar dropped to featherweight to fight Aldo, which, at the urging of Dana, became a permanent move. If in an alternate universe, Frankie decided to go back to 155, well, that's an interesting question. 
How do you think he would have fared? Below is a list of lightweight champs since he left. And I would favor him in a number of these matchups, most notably Pettis, Alvarez, and possibly McGregor. When we look back at his career, was his featherweight tenure the right move? Conor McGregor, zero defenses, Eddie Alvarez. Okay, Benson Henderson. Um, check out the Razor Black Widow Chromo. I have the Aza Delta. Can y'all see this? This is my, this is my keyboard. I have the, I have the Aza Delta. That's what I have. For whatever that's worth. Uh, I need a new one because it's not great. Uh, okay. Hold on here. Um, Dos Anjos is too big. Eddie Alvarez, their teammates. I don't know how that would have gone exactly. Um, Conor McGregor. Well, that's the interesting one, but Conor McGregor at 155 is just too big. For, in the end, I think those guys are just too big. He was in there when there was a little bit of a talent deficit. But then when that began to improve, I, I it's an interesting question. And the Benson Henderson one now, I would probably favor Frankie over Benson. Maybe even Pettis at this point. But Dos Anjos, Alvarez, and McGregor, I don't know. But McGregor at 145 drained. Maybe a different fight. Maybe a different fight. Let's see. I'm already getting some hater feedback. Um, let's see. Oh, dagger. Whoops. Let's see. All right. The subpar quality of Jones's defense. Jones is a multimillionaire. He's from a top gym. He's from a family of superstar athletes. He's rep by a well-known MMA agent who has dealt with similar issues with other high-profile clients. Even if they couldn't come up with enough evidence, the overall quality of the defense is inexcusable. I just think Jones needs to surround himself with better people. I'm pissed off because I really want to see him in the octagon again. P.S. I agree with you. They really shouldn't care about whether he's drinking or not. It's about his initial, uh, as potential PED usage, no more, no less. Yeah, they hold like, are you drinking again, John? Old man, none of your business. Really none of your business. If not, you should consider quitting. Really? Why? Why is that? Hmm? Not your business. Not, not even close to being his business. If you didn't know anything about John's past, what would you need to know to give a punishment about the Torino ball? And in the end, did any of that stuff ultimately affect their punishment? Maybe it would have given them a suspension versus a license revocation. But in the end, I just think that that is a way for them to grandstand. I don't actually think that if he applies for reinstatement after, you know, in August, if somehow USADA doesn't do anything, that they'll deny it. I just, I, I'm sorry, I just don't buy that. But. So, yeah, none of their business. Um, what did you guys want them to do? Now, there could have been more done in the way of rehearsing him or preparing him for a different set of questions or getting him to think about talking points and sticking to the narrative a little bit. But in the and I don't know what they did or didn't do. Um, but number one, Howard Jacobs' record is pretty good, actually. Uh, number two, he's his own man. If they prepped him, and that's the best he could do, then that's the best they could do. They can't answer for him. He had to speak, right? Um, I don't think they were expecting Maria Shen or Kidez to hammer her, hammer him. And maybe he didn't want to be prepped. Maybe he felt like, I'm just going to go in there and talk honestly. Like, the one thing that caught me by surprise yesterday was the... Hold on, I got this person just... They won't stop. Y'all need to stop harassing me. Hold on here. Sorry. Um, as I mentioned with the All Romero case, they had plenty of evidence. Everyone's like, well, Lucas Middlebrook did a great job. Lucas Middlebrook did do a good job. He's a great attorney, but he had a situation that was way more open to um, challenge. What are you supposed to do if you have no exonerating evidence and the one substance your client popped for is not controlled and there's no real research about it and there's no real way to make any firm conclusion about it that could be seen as exonerating. What are you supposed to do? You go take a lie detector. By the way, Diana Torisi took one of those too and helped her in 2004, although you know 2018, a bit of a different scenario. 
Um, what, are you, what are you supposed to do? And if your client, it, it, look, maybe he wanted to be coached. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he wanted to prep. Maybe he didn't. But if he doesn't, what are you supposed to do? You know, you can't make people do things that they, they don't want to do. You, and if, again, maybe he tried and that's the best he could. I, but the one answer that got me was, um, as I mentioned earlier, was um, when they asked him, can you guarantee to this commission it won't happen again? And I sort of understood where he was coming from, to be honest, where he was like, what am I supposed to do? I, I, I thought I was doing everything possible before. And um, here I am today, which which I understand. I think that's a fair point, actually, in terms of um, try, trying to be candid with the commission, uh, I guess. But I still think that what you have to say is, you know, no, I cannot guarantee you outcomes. I thought I, if I could guarantee you outcomes, we wouldn't be here today. But saying something to the effect of what I can guarantee you is that I will make every possible effort um, you know, as I've said, I said this on my show yesterday, you know, you have to try hard when times are good and you have to try hard when times are bad. You have to put the exact same amount of effort in to create good habits. And that's the only thing that I can guarantee you. If I do that, my hope is that you won't have to see me again in a circumstance like this, but, um, I don't want to tell you things that I don't know to be true. So what I will tell you is, and I know to be true, I will do everything possible to never be here again. And I hope that that, that effort is, um, successful. I think that would have been more satisfactory than, you know, if I thought that would work, I wouldn't be here. It's like, well, I appreciate the honesty, but I don't know. Someone says, follow-up question. Does having high-quality representation substantially help at all here? In this particular case, I don't think so, but that's because I don't know what kind of representation would. I know it's a small sample size, but Nick Diaz had a great lawyer in Lucas Middlebrook. There you go. Provided a solid defense, and they just smirked at him and raked Nick over the coals. Yeah, but there was blowback because of how good the defense was, Right. Part of the blowback was they were like, lifetime ban, no wait, five years. And you're thinking to myself, what are you, Kim Jong-un or something? But the other component there was that there was all this evidence that was, if not exonerating, certainly interesting, certainly worth taking seriously. And you could just tell that punishment was not merely egregious. It was egregious in addition because they just didn't care at all about um, trying to look at it. They wanted their pound of flesh. So it, it set up a narrative where they were not only heavy-handed, but they were especially heavy-handed and negligent for not trying to consider this exculpatory evidence. John Jones easily could have gotten better legal representation, sure, but in the end, would it have really done much? Probably not. Um, I understand there might be other factors at play here. And by the way, working with them behind the scenes and being compliant, as you heard the state's attorney mention at the beginning of the hearing, that is beneficial as well. Like, Lucas Middlebrooks uh, and, and I would argue Howard Jacobs, they kind of know how to like weave through the corridors of power to massage certain elements for their own interests. Um, isn't it effed up that Nick Diaz almost got a four year suspension for smoking weed and John Jones might not even see a year and a half? Y'all are the one that are y'all, y'all are the ones that like love anti doping and it's, clear inconsistencies in punishment for um, powerful people. So I'm not really sure what to say about that. Brock's return for Francis. Hi, Luke. How big of a fight would this be? Big. Probably the two biggest, strongest heavyweight stars clashing, which is what they made the initial fight between Brock and Overeem to be when Overeem returned to the UFC or made made his, you know, not return. Well, yeah, his, like, later on after Strike Force debut. There's no big name for Brock to fight other than Francis. Not true. Francis would have plenty of time for cardio. Hold on. Someone goes back to the question. Someone goes, it was horrendous. I'm talking about John's defense. I'm pretty sure they started defense prep for the first time at a crowded Starbucks. No, they didn't. They've been working on that for months. I've been trying to get Howard Jacobs on my show for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. I think they tried to exhaust every opportunity. Guys, what would you do? You have not, You tested everything, nothing there. The, the, the substance your guy tested positive for, there's no research done about it. Very, very, very little, and it's old and super minimal. And any kind of conclusion you would draw. Your client has a history of repeated offense. What would you do? <laughs> so everyone's like, this was so bad. You should have done something else. Okay, what? What studies can you draw upon? What I mean, you could maybe get a better expert witness who could have drawn a more forceful narrative. But even then, it's the same argument. You're just making 
an argument based on a series of assumptions, and those assumptions rest on super incomplete science. In the end, you get back to the same position. Everyone's talking about how bad the defense was. What are you going to do? Now, again, could more have been done in the way of prep? Maybe. Could more have been done in the way of cautioning about saying to John things you should say, things you shouldn't say? Maybe. But in the end of the day, you know, he's going to testify in the way he wants to testify. You can't control that. Well-coached clients can still say things uh, under oath that are inadvisable and that were probably specifically advised against. This is the way it goes. Anyway, back to Brock Francis. Um, Francis would have plenty of time for cardio and wrestling defense work with Brock and USADA delay. Fighters are sharpest usually right after a weakness is exposed and the agony of defeat is still fresh. Could be a great fight. Sure. I wouldn't be opposed to it. Any thoughts on... Oh, God. John Snowden had an inadvisable tweet. It was when Andrade were, was in north-south of Torres. Looks like something Mayweather or some stupid sports journalist would say. Yeah, yeah, not his best moment. Well, you know, John's a little of a wild man on Twitter, but um, yeah, that's not his best moment. That's, yeah, it's not really defensible. I like John very much. Lord knows I've said some stupid things on Twitter. Uh, yeah, it's inexcusable. Sure, I would agree with that. Uh, OSP versus Latifi, when a fighter taps, wait for the ref or release the choke. First of all, I don't think Latifi did anything wrong, but his sub of OSP made me think of scenarios where a fighter taps and the ref doesn't see it. When should the fighter release the choke if he feels a tap, but the ref doesn't stop the fight or wait for the ref to stop the fight? Right, most are going to wait for the ref to stop the fight. And a lot of times what you see is if they have like a guillotine like that, they might look at the ref and go, eh, you know, like trying to like, hey, do you see the tap? Um, you get that a lot. But a lot of them will just wait even uh, until they'll wait even through a tap for the ref to come get them. Like the tap indicates to the ref to separate them and then they let it go. Some will let go on the tap and then they get up before the ref intervenes. But then there's usually this moment of what happened. Um, but almost everyone is going to wait for the ref to separate them. Almost everyone. Can Cyborg handle Noob Cybot? Uh, for Mortal Kombat. <laughs> yeah, Yana Kuniskaya has no picture. I guess they'll fix that this weekend when they go and do pictures at the hotel, which they usually do um, on the week of the fight. But yeah, if you go to UFC.com slash schedule, you won't see a picture for Yana Kuniskaya. It's just sort of a blackout on outline. Hilarious. Hilarious. Danny Segura says that the UFC Glendale card might be better than Saturday's UFC 222. He might be right. It's like UFC Norfolk. It's like that card was amazing, you know. Some of these some of these fight nights every once in a while it turns to be pretty good. All right. Connor claiming to offer short notice UFC 222 fight versus Edgar. What do you make of Connor's claim? Not much. And if true, that he suddenly, after his record-long hiatus, wants to come back on short notice in a non-title fight against Edgar, who is not exactly first in line for the Connor fight. Well, depends who you believe here. But let's say, let's I, I don't know how much of that I believe. But there's one part of that I do believe. The one part is that he wants a big fight. And he might want it against somebody who everyone was like, you ducked Frankie. And you, know, what, you, you can make up your own mind about whether he ducked Frankie. But the one thing I do think is absolutely true is that... Uh, He doesn't want to do media if he can avoid it. Like, not saying he doesn't want to do media at all. I don't think that's right. But if he can avoid a large press conference or, or multiple press conferences, if he can avoid a world tour, if he can avoid sitting down for this outlet and that outlet and that outlet and this call and that call, and the, you know, I think that is definitely worn on him. The fact that he made it that explicit. Like, you have no idea how much work goes into promoting a fight beyond just getting ready for the fight itself. And, you know, having the UFC embedded crew up in your grill. And he seems legitimately fatigued by that. And I don't know how you can blame him, to be quite honest. You know, part of his charm is that he's so good at that. Um, and limiting that, I don't know how much it would hurt, depending on how much it was limited. Because he's such a big star at this point, he's not. He wasn't as he's a much bigger star than he was back when he did like the Aldo World Tour. So I think if he did less, it wouldn't necessarily be as much. Like they didn't do a huge amount of press for uh, 
they were the Pacquiao, you'll recall, and it still did, you know, insane numbers. Um, it's something like that, right? It's something like that where um, some press is probably required, and I think if he did some, all parties could be happy. I don't know that he needs to do the crazy stuff, but who knows what the UFC wants him to do, right? All right. Zabit and Merbeck, people are asking about them. Uh, Zabit, I don't think he's going to lose anytime soon, but Merbeck, uh, I think that's a closer fight. Uh, the Caving Cowboy, hello from London. Hello, London. I have noticed a trend with Cowboy and laying an egg in certain moments. Much has been made of his mental resilience or lack thereof, but I think it has more to do with the opponent uh, and the circumstances. Here are his losses. Till, Lawler, Masvidal, Dos Anjos, twice. Anthony Pettis, Nate Diaz. Here are his wins. Medeiros, Brown, Story, Cote, Oliveira, McDessie, Benson, Jory, Alvarez, Miller, uh, Barboza, Martins, Evan Dunham, Nunes, Gallard, Jeremy Stevens. He almost lost to Gallard. The trend I notice is one of meanness and confidence. If Soroni's opponent is evenly matched or inferior in means and meanness and confidence, Cowboy consistently performs to his ability and generally wins. If his opponent is more confident and meaner than him, his confidence seems to break. Cowboy consistently underperforms and generally loses. Uh, there's loads of psychological study around the behavior of animals' aggression, testosterone, and dominance. It seems to me that Cerrone wins when he's the meanest dog in the yard, but bricks when he isn't. There might be something to that. I also think some of those guys he lost to, Lawler, champion, Masvidal, uh, not a champion. Dos Anjos, champion. Pettis, champion. And then Diaz is an interesting case. But, you know, you have other, you have Alvarez, but that was his UFC debut. And then you have Benson Henderson. Of course, Benson Henderson beat him twice. Um, part of that is a categorization of fighters. Like, we can all agree. I mean, until we'll, we'll have to see. But Lawler, Masvidal, Dos Anjos, Pettis, Diaz, a little bit higher in the division than the most of those guys, if not all of them. But there might be something to that. There might be something to the idea of, like, Although Stevens is pretty aggressive, right? Up in his grill. He just couldn't handle him. It was, it was sort of a technical deficit at that point. But maybe you could say if they're reasonably close in technical ability and then the other person can really come out with this incredible confidence and physicality, that might sway them. There might be something to that. I wouldn't dismiss that. It's a, it's a, at a bare minimum, it's, a, it's an interesting thought to ponder. The MMA media that I follow is rightfully disgusted with the UFC's media-generated rankings. So why aren't more media members asking to take part in the voting? Because then you would be part of the UFC's matchmaking process, which I would consider to be sufficient enough of a conflict of interest to not participate. If I had a chance to change something I strongly opposed, I would. Well, become a media member and then do the rankings. No disrespect, just curious as to why yourself and others are not pursuing being part of legitimizing a currently broken system which would benefit the sport. Not my job to benefit the sport. Uh, my job is to cover the sport, not to benefit it or hurt it. Some things I do might hurt it. Some things I do might benefit it. But it's not my job either way. That is not at all what I am paid to do. And secondly, um, as I mentioned before, you then become part of the UFC's matchmaking apparatus, which is not also my job, nor uh, a... I, I don't. I don't agree that I, that is the kind of thing that either you're a media member or a journalist, which is a difference. Not neither of those should be involved in that. So, so there. There's a big conversation that needs to be had about rankings. I, I'll I'll do this later. Today's not the day. But I was arguing with some people, and I, I cannot believe that this is an argument. People think rankings is well, this guy beat that guy, and I think this guy would beat that guy again, or I think this guy is better than that guy. So I'm going to rank him higher, which is not even close to what rankings are for. Rankings have always been about establishing a contendership queue. That's what it's for, because otherwise you can't do it properly. Even then, it's fraught with disaster. But just sort of thinking out loud, like, well, I think this guy might beat that guy. Mm. He beat him two years ago. I guess that still kind of counts. That's how you get this rigidity in change, and lack of change anyway, where it, to, I mean, how can it possibly be true that Jose Aldo can get finished twice and in a rankings contendership queue be number one, which is another way of saying the guy most qualified to challenge for a title is Jose Aldo? 
It is insanity. If you look at how, uh, particularly let's take a look at the boxing amateurs, for example, the rankings help determine the seeding at the national tournament. When they're done correctly in other divisions, it's to establish a contendership queue for who gets a shot at the belt. Now, they have their own problems. Don't misunderstand me. It's not like some perfect system in either of those cases. But that's what it's for. Here's a belt. Here's the order in which we can establish based on the performance. We can establish who is next in line for this opportunity at a title. That's all it's about. It's not about anything else. Well, I think in a ge in a general way, this guy is better than that guy. What does that even mean? Does it mean anything? You can't define that. And trying to ass assign a number value to accomplishment, recent accomplishment, is also very difficult, which means there's tons of room for debate. But let me just tell you something. If you have Cain Velasquez, who hasn't competed since UFC 200, and he's ranked fourth, or you have Jose Aldo after getting, not just losing, finished back-to-back, -back, and then you're saying to the world, that's the most qualified candidate for a title shot, your rankings are broken broken completely totally broken um i think his name is case hearts if i'm getting it wrong please forgive me he does this awesome video where he shows month over month top five top ten so one to five six to ten in the rankings for uh any division and then he shows month over month how they change and what you see is that from six to ten there's a fair degree of change and then one to five, there can often be changed too. It's not that there's no change. But the majority of the turnover happens after five. And even then, there's some rigidity about that as well. And the reason why is because if you beat somebody, even if it's a historic two years ago, people will still hold that in place. Well, he beat him back then. It must mean in some, in some, in the firmament of heaven, X is always better than Y. So Y has to go and beat the brakes off the rest of the division to ever get a shot at being ranked above it. When in fact, if this person loses and has, after having a title shot and this person has been reasonably active or has made some wins and is now a more qualified candidate for a fresh matchup for the division, that's who you rank higher. That's how rankings work. You can't do it any other way. It doesn't make sense to do it any other way. Unless, of course, you guys want to keep having the exact same problem where someone gets a position at three or four in a division and then just holds it forever. And then always says no to fights against five, always says no to fights against six. If that's what you want, I encourage you to keep voting the way you're voting. I encourage you, I encourage you to keep supporting rankings the way they are. I've got real bad news for you. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out either. They are broken. And a big reason why they're broken is people don't even understand what it is they're voting on. You are voting on contendership for a title shot. That is what that is. Who has amassed the best resume not merely historically, but in a uh, uh, relatively recent time, and that can be debated too, but there's no firm amount around that. How do you push that person to the next title shot? Who is the next deserving guy for a title shot? It can't have any meaning otherwise because then the meaning becomes completely arbitrary. Uh, Iaquinta and Felder, what do you think of this fight and how will they play out? Your prediction for this fight? I think Felder, if it stays on the feet, will win. I think if I Quinta mixes it up, it could be a very, very interesting contest. Any X factors you can think of? Ooh, Felder's takedown defense. I Quinta's big power. Um, they both have pretty good cardio. Same question again. Company you keep. Hi, Luke. I hope you're well. After watching a portion of the hearing yesterday, I'm of the opinion that John's management team did a woeful job of preparing him for what he had to endure, nor are they doing much to wash the stink off of him, if you will. After seeing his demeanor and his lack of contrite contrition, I think you mean, for his past actions, do you think his team failed him? Nope, I don't. Or do you think it's a lack of self-awareness that fumbled him yesterday? I just don't think he's in a very strong position. I don't think he's in a very strong position. I'm not saying it couldn't have been things he could have done differently or that that was the best possible opportunity, but I, I think he walked into that courtroom in terms of the things he could reasonably do to defend himself, and he had not a lot to do. Not a lot. He had not a lot of opportunity. Really as simple as that. If Mike Perry could improve one aspect of his game before his next fight, what would it be? 
footwork, head movement, cardio, punching technique, game plan implementation, combination punching, takedown defense. Um, I'll say head movement. Cardio looked to be not that bad. His punching technique obviously needs work, but it's done good for him. Game plan implementation was a bit of an issue. Combination punching, not really. Takedown defense is okay. Head movement's a bit of an issue, and footwork was okay. The biggest ones to me were head movement and game plan implementation, I would say. All right, quickly. Bellator versus UFC fantasy matchups. Chandler versus Edgar. I'll go Chandler. Lima versus Lawler. Ooh. Hmm. I go Lawler. Habib versus Askren. <laughs> Askren only because of the size. MVP versus Wonderboy. I go Wonderboy. Big time. Uh, all right, let's go to the Twitter machine at L Thomas News on Twitter. See what you guys have to say. You can shoot me a question over there, anything you want. Yada, yada, yada. All right, if Edgar loses this weekend, is he officially the unluckiest fighter on the roster? Maybe. You know, waiting for a title shot forever, and then he has to go and fight this guy who's up and coming. It's, ugh, brutal. Also, how do you see Jacare versus Gastelum going? Winner gets next shot after Romero. I, I'll be honest, I had kind of buried. I had kind of buried Jacare. I, I, I totally was wrong about that. He didn't look great in the Whitaker fight, but, you know, it's like the Whitaker fight. And he came back, he looked awesome against Derek Brunson. So that's a really tough question. For me, it's an issue of where that fight takes place because I think the fast hands and the combination punching of Gastelum is a nightmare for any of those older guys in that division. But if it's on the ground, Gastelum's a good wrestler, but he can ultimately be positionally overwhelmed, I think, a little bit. So to the extent that fight is standing is a fight that Gastelum can win. <clears throat> I think this was a reference when he said Barry Bonds was involved in boxing. How does John Jones handle his recent failure in this case hearing uh, and the quest to be among the great fighters like Barry Bonds? True or false? Connor's next two bouts are GSP and Nate part three. I'll say false. Let's go down a little bit. Would you give us a tour of your new studio when it's completed? Yes. In term, Not just that. All the things I had to do to make it work, the new equipment and everything else. But on top of that, how I was able to finance it. I'm going to do it. So, like, how did I how did I get from zero to 60? I'm going to do everything for you guys, too. Um, the return is on the assumption Brock is clean for at least six months under you. Out of testing, no exemptions. And Mark Hunt versus a clean Brock would give Hunt a chance at redemption versus a guy who cheated him. It will sell. Uh, sure. If you guys want to believe nonsense, you are entitled to it. If Ty Tuivasa one day becomes the UFC heavyweight champion, will you do a shoey on the live chat? Yes. Yes, I will. What do you think of Patty Pimblett's flying triangle at Cage Warriors 90 this past weekend in Liverpool? I thought that was a hell of a move, presence of mind, and a great win because people were writing him off a little bit. And that was a quick reminder he is not to be trifled with. Do you believe that it is the UFC's interest, not best interest, it is in the UFC's interest for UFC 222 to have a mediocre buy rate. Sub-250 pay-per-view buys would significantly hinder Cyborg's bargaining power and create a narrative that she isn't a draw. I don't think they're in the business of wanting people to do poorly on pay-per-view. But if they do, they're happy to use that against them. But I don't think they, like, root for it. Um... Someone says, I prefer the white to the usual ISIS flag. Can you explain Bellator 200 and being in London as a UK fan? This makes zero sense. Nobody here outside of the hardcore fan knows of Bellator, plus their TV arrangement is a mess. So as I understand it, what happens is when they go to uh, overseas, it's a big part of their strategy because they use a local crew for production. So they... They use that local promotion, which does a lot of that local advertising, by the way, and they save a ton of money in the process. Um, now, there can be an issue with production quality and some other issues, but I was told that by a really reliable source that uh, that's why they do that. 
is it's a way to um, put on technically a big show if they want to. They don't have to put on a big show, but it's a cost saving feature. The European shows are a cost saving feature because they partner locally with somebody who incurs the brunt of the expenses. Uh, let's see. How, how comfortable is your fancy gamer chair compared to other computer chairs you have sat on? It's the most comfortable computer chair I've ever sat in. Now, the one in my studio in Sirius XM is pretty nice too, but this is this is pretty great. Luke, would you be willing to show up at a UFC event and assist me in performing a citizen's arrest of anyone caught wooing in the crowd? No, I just won't show up. Uh, so few of the commissioners hearing the John Bones Jones case seem to be informed or care at all. I counted three. I consider myself a hardcore fan, and I thought the CSAC generally knew what they were doing. Is three competent people above average for athletic commissions? Three competent people is like, that's like a, I mean, I don't know how to explain it. That's like, you know, if I told you you had a party and there were three really attractive women there, would you consider that like good? Depending on the size of the party, yeah. Uh, does the UFC have any influence on John's trial with USADA? It's not a trial with USADA unless he goes to arbitration. I mean, unofficially. We are welcome to speculate. I'm trying to go to UFC 225 in Chicago, but who in the world are you going to get to headline? Who is even possibly available for that? Better question for Ariel, but I would imagine that, of course, CM Punk would be on that card. Uh, do you think this could be a possibility in the Jones case? While his team is claiming foul play, someone spiking his drink with PEDs, that this was in part of the ever-growing tension between humans and machines and a robot spiked his drink. Yes, sure. Whatever. Uh, again, so happy to see that Luke Thomas News has escaped ISIS. I did, y'all. I was in Raqqa all this time. Now I'm back here in Washington, D.C. You know what time it is. Do you think Connor will try again to step in late notice to avoid doing too much media? Yes. What, now, whether he actually makes it or not, different story. But uh, I don't think the CSAC was out of line with their questions. Number one, there's no jury. The commissioners are the informed body. Okay, they're not out of line legally. If that's what you're noting. Two, CSAC can use character to be more lenient, which they didn't. Uh, three, asking a possible addict if they're sober... I wish JBJ had addressed this more fully. It has nothing to do with whether or not he had to run a bowl in a system and what the appropriate punishment should be for a first defense in the state. Zero. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And if you ask me, do I really think that they care that he may or may not be an addict or someone who abuses substances? I do not. Um, I, do, I do believe, however, that they like grandstanding. Other than piling up wins, what makes a local scene MMA fighter ready for the UFC? Sometimes if they've created a buzz locally, like people would know, like, oh, if you're going to go to Michigan, you know, that guy is the guy. That, that can be one. Um, uh, and, and the ability to sell tickets, too, by the way, depending on who you're going to sign with. That's big. Um, have you had any kind of viral moment out there, right? Um, you know, the soccer mom or the getting knocked out. Remember that? Um, well, that was a loss, but the person who knocked her out ended up moving on. So there's a bit of that. Just, you know, are you signed by a big-time manager and you're owning things in the local scene? There's just certain ways that word trickles up. Could be virality. Could be connections to a big camp. That's another big one. Hey, man, if you're a big, famous fighter talking to Sean Shelby, we got this kid coming up. You got to see him, that kind of a thing. So there's that. Um, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that can, that can be that. The worst thing about the current ranking system is the loop. Bisping beat Rockhold, Rockhold beat Weidman, Weidman beat Gastelum, Gastelum beat Bisping. Yes, there's plenty of ways to do that. You That only, if someone goes, there's no way to fix this. In the current system, right, because the current system is a joke. There's plenty of ways to fix that. A, somebody can be ranked above somebody they beat them, provided a set of circumstances are in place, including if that person had a title shot and lost, and this other person, since losing the other person, has gone on a series of wins to rightfully claim that they should be next for a title shot. The Q doesn't go like this. The Q goes like this. It rotates this way. If you constantly see it as a ladder where you can't cross it, fine. It's more of a wheel. That's how you have to look at it. And you just dial the wheel whichever direction it needs to go. But people think of it like, well, I can't go up in the ladder because I lost to this guy. He's now ahead of me. 
well, I'm stuck in this position forever. Yeah, you can see why that's a dumb ass way of doing rankings that makes no sense at all. That's how you get a guy who hasn't competed in nearly two years being fourth in a division. Well, he beat all those guys below them. Who gives a damn? It happened so long ago. It's not relevant anymore. It's so not relevant anymore. Move on. All right, somebody's bitter about something. Do I think you all had enough time for weight cutting? No. And I think he'll be just fine next time. Any info regarding Justin Buckles? Tried to get him on my show today. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I'm looking into it like everybody else is, I'm sure. Um, any thoughts on the Edmonton Commission already changing course on the year ban on combative sports after Tim Higgs' untimely death? Seems like they are making it up as they go along. I didn't. I, I, I'll, I'll cop to it. I did not actually see what they did, which is unfortunate. But I'm sure that um, um, Eric McGracken or Mike Russell did. So go check out their Twitter feeds. They are probably uh, much more helpful in this regard. People, companies donating to them and then selling are two different things, aren't they? You cannot say they do this to sell. What? what? I, I, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. That's enough, I think, on Twitter for now. Oh, does Jones have a date for his USADA hearing? I have looked into that. I cannot find anything. Malky told me on my show that it would be, I think, done no later than the end of March. So less than a month. But if a punishment comes down and then he challenges it, it could go on beyond that. So, so we'll see. Here, that, this is my sense. I just don't buy, no matter what, that he's going to fight in 2018. But I think it's, and of course, if it's a two years, he will fight in 2019. I guess what I would say is first or second quarter, 2019. He might fight. He might fight then. In your opinion, are you UFC fighters employees or independent contractors? Well, the way that's measured, um. Of course, the federal government has to agree that that's true for classification's sake. But one of the ways that they do that, uh, if you sue, for example, is they look, and there's more than just suing. Of course, you can get through a union and it changes everything. But let's say you sued for recognition. Um, they'll look at a series of things. It's not like you have to have X and Y and Z. You can have X and Y, maybe not Z, but then you have A and maybe not B, but you have C. And if it's enough of the balance of them outweighs it, then yes. But to the point where you know, you're asking your whereabouts 24-7, you're watching Tim Kennedy shower, um, you're making them wear Reebok kits. Now you're tying the Reebok pay um, to behavior during fight week, as they we know now from the reporting of Mark Ramundi. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it seems almost like absurd to uh, to argue that they're independent contractors. Uh, overhyped prospects. Who do you feel are among the most overhyped prospects in the UFC? Meaning the expectations seem to be way higher than what's realistic for them. If you don't want to call anyone out specific, feel free to comment. Someone says Manny Bermudez. Uh, Sean O'Malley, Mackenzie Dern. We'll see about Sean O'Malley. He has an interesting test, and I, I don't, I can't really say one thing or the other about Manny Bermudez. Sean O'Malley is an interesting one. I, I was not that high on him coming out of the show, Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series, but he's so young and getting so much better that maybe some belief in his ability to improve is fair. So we're very interested in this fight against Andre Sukmantat. So we'll see how that goes. And then Mackenzie Dern. Here's the thing: she obviously is super talented. Uh, but I thought it was a little bit early. I think there's a th there's a certain lack of physicality with the wrestling that gets me. It's just a little. She doesn't quite have that drive. Not, I mean, she has a drive here. She's and here, she has a total competitor's mindset and heart. But I don't mean that exactly. I mean like uh, something a little different. Something like. Um, there's just not a lot of the, like. She has like trip takedowns and like, you know, the kind where you like, I, I don't know the name of it, where you can get like a body lock and then you can press behind the knee and then rotate to a direction. You can sag your weight and they fall. They fall. All of these things can help you. Uh, they're great takedowns, but they, they, they signal a certain lack of physicality that gives me a little bit of heebie-jeebies. But it may be plenty for women's weight. Just, just something I'm paying attention to. Um, let's see. Amazon to carry UFC pay-per-views. Yes, this is real. I saw that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it means. If you're a prime customer, you have still have to pay for them, right? So um, they're still being charged. But yes, interesting that Amazon's getting into the pay-per-view game. 
be curious to see what that is because you're like if you're doing that you're undercutting p fight pass right um you're telling folks well, it's probably just better for us we can make more money selling off amazon than we can off fight pass okay i still believe that fight pass could be more than it is and they're just not putting a lot of effort into it so i don't know i don't really know what to say about it other than it's interesting development um it might portend big changes heading forward. You still have to pay for them. But if you're a UFC customer, what are the chances you are? Amazon Prime member or a Fight Pass customer? I'm betting Amazon Prime. And I'm also betting that they believe they can advertise on Amazon's platform as people are on it. They're, they're, Amazon must have incredible amounts of data about like how much time people spend on their website, video purchasing and consumption habits, you know, what the real offer there is. But the real thing that stands up to me is you're you're, necess you're necessarily undercutting Fight Pass by doing that. And that, to me, signals something for the future. Uh, all right, so we got to go. Let me pull up here on my thing here. Still, I've used a PC in like 20 years, so my first time using it in a long time. Appreciate you guys watching. I hope that the signal was not too bad today. As I mentioned, work in progress. Hopefully by next week. I'll be downstairs, but no guarantees on that one. We'll see how things go. If you missed, uh, what am I saying? Uh, if you uh, want to get this on iTunes, you can do that. iTunes.com slash promotional malpractice. There is an MMA beat tomorrow. Of course, the whole crew is going to be uh, in Vegas for UFC 222. Ariel's out there. I'm not sure who else is out there, but I know he's out there. Esther and Casey are out there. So look out for tons of coverage on MMA fighting. We're going to have you covered. I appreciate you guys watching so much. And until next time, Stay frosty.